Welcome to the France 24 debate. The French President Emmanuel Macron has told the Paris Peace Forum that multilateralism is under threat. So we're examining the issue in this program. International cooperation for the common good. This year's forums focusing on efforts to beat the COVID crisis. $425 million has been pledged. A uh, hundred of those, a hundred million from France alone. Let's hear them from President Macron. For a year now, we have had a pandemic that has spread across the world in an unprecedented manner. COVID-19 is preventing us from seeing each other physically and is changing our lives. Terrorism is once again rearing its head in Europe and in other countries, like on Wednesday in Africa. We are facing heightened tensions, and the challenges I've mentioned serve as a reminder of the complexity of our problems. Regarding those challenges, we have to agree on a similar vision of the world. That vision has to be shared between developed countries, developing countries, and emerging countries, whatever their level of economic, financial, and social development because the challenges are the same for all, and we cannot overcome them without one another. President Macron at the uh, Paris Peace Forum, of course, it's all been held virtually because of the COVID-19 pandemic. International cooperation, vital then to making progress, not just on the COVID question, but also matters of security, defence, business, climate change. And coming back to the forum's chief aim, it's in the name, peace. But is such cooperation uh, realistic in this modern age? Some might ask, has it ever been realistic? The EU, the European Union, might prove and at the same time disprove the rule. But whatever your opinion, and I defend your right to have that opinion, one thing I think is certain, this COVID pandemic is turning out to be a real game changer. Let's uh, not hesitate any further and bring in our guests with ideas of plenty to discuss this. Joining us from Paris, the international affairs consultant Estelle Yusufa, Estelle, good evening to you. And joining us from FECON, Patrick Chevalero, international affairs consultant and member of Open Diplomacy at International Affairs Think Tank. Thank you both for joining us. Estelle, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Uh, and I know you have uh, more uh, than an eye interested in what's happening in Africa. I'm wondering whether you feel that multilateralism uh, in, in all its various forms has ever really benefited Africa. <laughs> You go straight to the point. I think we have to. <laughs> um, of course. Um, I think that many African countries would beg to differ. Um, the continent has suffered from a Western, Northern vision of multilateralism that hasn't necessarily benefited uh, the continent. I would say, though, that... Um, multilateralism within Africa has proved very useful when African countries try and manage to work together. Uh, therefore, I don't think that the concept itself is dead, but I think that on the international stage, it could get better. <laughs> and the fact that Macky Sall is alongside um, Emmanuel Macron, of course, it's, it's lending uh, some, some weight to the fact that the forum this year is about trying to create a, a sort of key uh, link between uh, Europe and Africa to try to boost things there. Why hasn't this happened before, Estelle? So let's take, for example, President Macron's statement on finding a common goal, finding common interest and working together. Let's talk about climate change because President Macron raised the issue. For example, African countries are asked to slow down their growth, uh, to have a green growth, but Western northern countries refuse to allow a cheaper version of the green technology to grant access to African countries uh, to the northern technology, the Western countries' technology. Um, so in a way, the vision that um, Macron is pushing for Africa does not necessarily benefit Africans. And that's where somehow you see where some countries are indirectly slowing down because they're looking for their own interests. And so far, the deal hasn't necessarily benefited everyone the same way. Indeed, one rule for you and one rule for me and one rule for them and one rule for other people. That's no way to run uh, a playground 
um, game, and it's definitely no way to run a country, one might say, and definitely no way to run a world. Let's bring in Patrick for his thoughts. Patrick joining us uh, by Skype from Northern France. Patrick Chevalier from uh, Open Diplomacy, International Affairs Consultant. Patrick, thanks for being with us. Um, Estelle sort of talking there about uh, the Africa angle. Um, you can elaborate on that if you wish. I'm just wondering whether uh, the first question I'll put to you is this one. Do you agree with what President Macron says, that multilateralism is under threat? Yeah, of course, uh, absolutely. Um, the, the world today is not, uh, it's certainly not safer than it was, uh, I would say, year, years ago. Uh, so um, there is a, an, an obvious uh, requirement for um, the countries, um, the willing countries, I would say, to, to work together uh, with all uh, stakeholders. And, uh, of course, the, the Paris Peace Forum is the third edition now, and the issues of defense and security are not at the core of this, uh, of, of this conference. I would say uh, defense and security is behind the, the, the curtain. And in this area also, uh, we have to work together. And uh, certainly the big news of the, last, uh, of the last week is the arrival of the new uh, of a new um, U.S. Uh, administration, and uh, I am personally convinced that uh, you uh, absolutely need uh, to uh, to have a better cooperation with this new administration than the one it, it had with the, with the Trump's administration in the last four years. So you would applaud uh, the arrival. Uh, of course, if it's confirmed, because Donald Trump still disputes it, doesn't he? There's this whole, whole kerfuffle going on uh, in Washington about the whole transition uh, of power. So, uh, but let's go with um, what we think the situation is, of course, and there's no reason for us to disbelieve it, apart from Donald Trump saying it's been a fix and he's yet to prove anything along those lines. Joe Biden in the White House, that's better news for multilateralism, do you think, Patrick? Yes, absolutely. I, I would say I am... I am cautiously uh, optimistic. Uh, almost everything which is coming is probably better than the deteriorated uh, relationship we had uh, to experience during the last uh, the last four years. So I don't want to uh, to say, like some uh, uh, analysts or observers, that uh, um, who says that Europeans shouldn't enjoy. Uh, the, the four years ahead, that the issues will stay. Of course, the issues will, will stay. But uh, uh, there will be a difference of tone. And uh, what um, we can observe uh, right now is that uh, the, the, the skills uh, will be there in the future industry. So, in other words, we can expect um, the return of very experienced uh, uh, diplomats and defense and security advisor. Uh, the adults will be back uh, will be back in the room, and this is a very good news. Um, so we, we, we have to see. I'm, I'm pretty much confident. Confident from you. Let's go back to Estelle. S same question, uh, but I sense a different angle. Um, Estelle, Macron's words there, multilateralism under threat. Um, Joe Biden, his election, do you feel that could perhaps open uh, some doors of optimism for countries in Africa? I don't know about Africa, but I would want to comment on what my uh, colleague said, uh, my fellow spe speaker said. Um, multilateralism is based on Pax Americana and on institutions that the Americans helped build. The deep impact of Trump has been destroying or weakening, really weakening, those in international institutions. I'm talking about NATO, I'm talking about the World Trade Organization, I'm talking about the UN. Therefore, if one wants to rekindle an appetite for multilateralism, you will need the institutions. And yes, President Trump has been very blunt and very active and very, very methodical in destroying these institutions. But there hasn't been much help from the other parts, the other country, to prevent or to help those institutions resist the assaults uh, coming from Washington. That's my first point. The second point is also regarding each and everyone's interests on the global stage to have multilateralism back. 
some countries are really benefiting from this chaos, the current disorganization. And the first country, obviously, is China. The other one is Russia. Some would argue also that Turkey, who is a NATO, which is a NATO member, has also largely benefited from the fact that the U.S. have been looking inwards. Now, from an African point of view, what is very interesting is that for so many years we had international experts and all the international affairs specialists saying, oh, chaos will come from uh, Africa, the country, the, the continent of despair, and so on and so forth. So far this year, the worst news have been coming from the US, where we have seen before our very eyes the, the base of the strongest democracy shaken to its core and all the basis of what Pax Americana stands for, which is rule of law, which is democracy, which is good governance, which is fighting corruption, which, which is good faith, all of that shaken to its core in the US. That's extremely hard to rebuild. Because you need to have some sort of moral ground to lecture your partners and, and tell them how you want things to be run. Now, will the U.S. be able to regain that status? I'm not sure. But has the Europe, the European Union being able to fill those shoes while the, the U.S. were away? They haven't even, either. So... You have that situation where you have the Europeans who have been in despair looking at the U.S. losing their way, but they haven't been able to step up to the plate. So this hope for multilateralism, in a way, seems a bit hollow. And the situation, Estelle, just to stay with you for a second, I mean, talking Africa, you, you mentioned there, um, I'm thinking about the situation in Ethiopia. Uh, where yeah. there is a conflict going on there. Um, has the vacuum that's been created over the past four years enabled that to happen in some way? Absolutely. But if you look at uh, the, the, the lack of uh, democracy in the latest vote in Ivory Coast, if you look at the coup in Mali, if you look at the very shaky situation in Senegal, if you look at the very shaky situation in Guinea, you can tell uh, the, the situation on the ground in Africa proves that when some leaders are left to their own devices, it's not good news. When you have no referee, uh, no adult in the room, and some can argue that France, nor the UK, nor the US have really been the actual grown-ups that they pretended to be. Nonetheless, you have also seen on the African stage some heads of states really behaving in a way that has left every observer in total despair. Estelle, thank you. Patrick Chevalier, to bring you back in on that one. Um, I'm kind of wondering whether the concept of multilateralism by its very nature, uh, the fact that it is a, a multiplicity of, of heads thinking about one issue, uh, can have advantages, but has disadvantages too. And on the world stage, if you look at, say, the, the swift movement of, of, of autocrats, uh, of, of countries where there is one leader and it isn't at all uh, discussed uh, openly why that leader is there. I'm thinking Russia, I'm thinking China, uh, and to an extent thinking Turkey too, as, as Estelle was mentioning. These countries have had more, an, more, more of an advantage uh, to put their stamp uh, on a place where perhaps the US has pulled out and other countries get banded together like France, like, like the United Kingdom or the whole of the EU can't make that impact. Yes, absolutely. You are absolutely right. And, and that's why one of the most important questions uh, ahead of us is what will be the level uh, of, the, of the American reinvestment uh, in, uh, in the global stage. Um, we, we certainly will need, because you, Europe, Europe has, has some strength, of course, has some will, but has not all the capacity which is to, to, to be, um, be a, a strong global player. So once again, I think the return of the, of the United States uh, with, a, with a president, with a president-elect who is very knowledgeable about the, 
the international affairs, who, who has been the chairman of the of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate, who has been the vice president of the U.S. under the Obama administration, with a with a strong uh, portfolio on international affairs, uh, is uh, is of added value. Um, and, and of course, we will have to. He will have to stand uh, against um, the, some of the countries you, you, are, you are describing. For we, the Europeans, the behavior of Turkey in Eastern Med, the behavior of Turkey is, in Northern Africa is, is an issue. Uh, I only uh, noticed that a few uh, weeks ago, um, Biden, in a written statement, uh, has um, asked the, the Trump administration to be tougher on the behavior of Turkey. Uh, in the Eastern Med in its standoff uh, against Greece. So maybe this is an indication of, uh, of, of the will uh, of the United States to, to, to come back and to, and to wait on some of these uh, very important issues for, for we, the Europeans. Indeed, it is uh, nonetheless immediately a change of Trump's America first uh, philosophy. Uh, clearly, uh, we can see that happening already and uh, vowing Joe Biden to go back into, say, for instance, the Paris uh, climate accords, which is uh, something he said he'd do straight away. That was one of the first things that Trump pulled out of. Estelle, final word to you. We've got no time left, but I can't re resist asking you, do you think uh, that the uh, recalibration of multilateralism can happen uh, quickly, can happen within, say, one Biden mandate? Oh, no. <laughs> There's too much work to be done to rebuild that. No, I don't think that one administration, American uh, multilateral uh, thinking will help. It, it, it will be a slow process. Estelle Yusuf, thank you very much. Estelle Yusufa, sorry, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you to Patrick Chevalier too for joining us from Northern France. That's it for part one of this debate, but stay with us. More to come. Part two's next. Welcome back to the France 24 debate. We're looking at the issue of multilateralism after the words of Emmanuel Macron, French president, speaking at the Paris Peace Forum. He said that multilateralism is under threat. Les réponses utiles de notre monde. For a year now, we have had a pandemic that has spread across the world in an unprecedented manner. COVID-19 is preventing us from seeing each other physically and is changing our lives. Terrorism is once again rearing its head in Europe and in other countries, like on Wednesday in Africa. We are facing heightened tensions, and the challenges I've mentioned serve as a reminder of the complexity of our problems. Regarding those challenges, we have to agree on a similar vision of the world. That vision has to be shared between developed countries, developing countries and emerging countries, whatever their level of economic, financial and social development. Because the challenges are the same for all, and we cannot overcome them without one another. Emmanuel Macron speaking at the Paris Peace Forum. It's all been done uh, virtually because of the COVID-19 lockdown, as indeed this program is largely being done virtually too, to make sure our guests are safe uh, in their own space. And I'm, of course, isolated here in the studio. Nonetheless, the welcome is very warm for our two guests uh, for this second part of the France 24 debate. Uh, they are joining us uh, uh, from Paris, Frédéric Charion, who's a professor of international relations. Thank you, sir, for being with us. And joining us from the uh, Paris Peace Forum, the Director General uh, Justin uh, Weiss. Justin, thank you very much for being with us. I will start with you. Uh, President Macron talking about threats to multilateralism. Uh, you can announce, I know, that uh, a uh, not insignificant amount of money has been pledged uh, to help fight uh, the COVID crisis and relaunch countries. Can you tell us more about this cash? Absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that there's been a deterioration of multilateralism over the past 10, 15 years. And then a breakdown of multilateralism, indeed, and international cooperation since the pandemic struck. And one concrete effect was to prevent countries from bending together, from cooperating on what we all need, which is vaccines. We all need that 
other countries be vaccinated. Otherwise, we will not be able to do away with this pandemic. And so what we did at the Paris Peace Forum this afternoon was to gather all the important uh, leaders of this initiative called Act A uh, around vaccines. Uh, Emmanuel Macron was there, Ursula von der Leyen, the EU Commission, uh, but also Tedros Ghebreyesus, the Director General of WHO, Melinda Gates of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and many others. And together they relaunched, they gave a new impetus to that initiative and they uh, announced more than $500 million uh, towards making vaccines available to all, to all countries in particular. I mean, that is obviously a great thing. Um, just um, bear with us. I'll bring in um, our other guest, uh, Frédéric Charion, for uh, a comment too. Frédéric, the, the idea of multilateralism. Do you think, had there been a stronger sense of that, uh, the pandemic might not have taken hold the way it did? I'm perhaps asking you for a health perspective, but in terms of the idea of multilateral approaches, do you think if there been more cooperation between countries, it wouldn't have spread as quickly from China as it did? <laughs> Um, multilateral. Everybody needs multilateralism today. That's uh, that's an observation that everybody makes. So, but but President Macron was absolutely right to say that it is under threat. It is under threat mostly for political reasons, and it's not the first time. Uh, multilateralism is probably under threat because after four years of. Uh, Trump presidency, no, no, I don't want to have polemic here, but uh, obviously uh, the role of the United States has always been crucial in the support to multilateralism. When the U U.S. doesn't help, we can see the difference. Um, so, of course, there is a hope now that with a new administration, multilateralism is less uh, under threat. And the pandemic is um, also an incentive to, to support multilateralism. In terms of that pandemic, though, I mean, can I go back to you, Justin, and put the same question to you? Uh, would multilateralism, in your opinion, have stopped the spread of the, uh, the virus, uh, getting out of China, going as far as it did so quickly? Well, you know, obviously one big question here is the WHO, right? Uh, because we all know that there were delays uh, in January in announcing and spreading the word about uh, the vaccine. And the problem is that uh, it's the same as what happened with Ebola in 2014, uh, six years ago. That is to say, uh, WHO is in the hands of governments uh, that allow or do not allow uh, WHO to do its uh, job, uh, whether in Africa or in China or elsewhere. And so what was uh, lacking and what could have worked better uh, is uh, the WHO uh, mechanisms. Uh, but it's not the fault of WHO. It's the fault of countries that have not cooperated enough, that have not been uh, forthcoming enough in, in, in sharing information and in uh, taking measures that would have uh, prevented the rapid spread. I've got to ask you the question, Justin, given you've said what you just said. Uh, you don't agree with Donald Trump, do you, that the WHO was in, uh, in the pocket of China? I do not agree. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, good relations between Dr. Tedros, uh, the Director General, and uh, and China. But that does not explain its position. What explained the position of WHO is that it needed to have good diplomatic relations, if I could say so, with uh, China because it needed to get access to information. Information was lacking. So during these crucial weeks of uh, January, WHO tended to woo China in order to get this uh, information. Uh, and uh, that's what allowed President Trump to portray uh, WHO uh, as, uh, uh, as, as being under China's uh, influence uh, and then to withdraw from WHO, thereby compounding uh, the troubles of that organization. Justin Weiss, thank you very much indeed. Stay with us. Frederick Charion coming back now, Professor of International Relations, joining us from Paris. Uh, Frederick, in terms of getting the vaccine uh, around the countries, getting it to those who need it, um, surely international cooperation is going to be key, isn't it? Of course. Uh, but international relations is always a matter of balance of power, too. That's what we're just witnessing right now. And multilateralism is a good way to try to tame, to try to circumvent this this very brutal balance of power. In the, in the, in the case of the vaccine, uh, in the case of health and medicine in, in general, multilateralism has always helped to compensate for 
the most brutal balance of power. Remember, uh, Jacques Chirac's initiative a long time ago, um, uh, and Medic Ed, uh, uh, United, sorry, the United uh, scheme to support the, the, the poorest countries by providing them some medicine that they could not afford at the highest price. Uh, multilateralism uh, at that time showed that it was a good way to uh, to be more uh, to have more equality to today that's that's probably the the problem we have a global pandemic some countries will be insisting that uh, a vaccination or uh, a remedy against this uh, this pandemic should be a global common should be a common good should be shared um, the, these countries who support this idea are the ones who support multilateralism they, they are the same we will probably uh, have a confrontation between them and those who do not believe in multilateralism today. Indeed. Who would those countries be? Can you just spell it out for us? The countries will support, you mean, or we yes. do not support? A bit of both. I mean, if you can just make it clear for us uh, all. Well, so far, the United States have a very... Uh, so far, the United States, with an uh, incumbent administration, had a pretty, not unilateral, but pretty... Um, uh, individual uh, stance and uh, approach to that. Then it, it, it remains to, to be seen whether the more authoritarian uh, regimes, uh, Russia or, or maybe China, will support the idea of um, vaccination as a common good. Frederick Sherryon, thank you very much indeed. Stay with us. Let's go back to the Director General of the Paris Peace Forum, uh, Justin Weiss, who confirmed uh, that massive sum of money which is being uh, allocated to help countries uh, get kick on from COVID-19 because this is one of the big problems, isn't it? How do you how do you get things to, to function again? How do you make things work? We've had John Castex, uh, Justin, uh, just saying uh, that it's uh, unreasonable to expect to have uh, parties over Christmas and New Year here in France. So he's at a risk of being sort of cartooned as the Grinch who stole Christmas in many ways. But people recognise, I'm sure, that sacrifices need to be made. As I think uh, Frederick was saying, there is a fatigue. Uh, about what's going on. There is people are tired of what's happening and, and they need somehow to get through this. Um, what do you think your organisation can do in helping this process and making things kick on and advance? Well, uh, several things. Uh, and uh, since you're mentioning that people are getting tired, I would quote uh, Dr. Tedros, the head of uh, WHO, he said, uh, maybe we are getting tired. The, the virus is not getting tired. That is to say, it is as lethal as it was uh, at the beginning in March, in February, March, April of this year. And so we should not uh, uh, assume that uh, it's just going to uh, go away. What can the Paris Peace Forum do? Well, you know, just uh, earlier this afternoon, we had more than 60 heads of state, government and international organization uh, uh, sort of uh, outlining together what was necessary to get out of the crisis. And among other things, and I'm leaving aside uh, the issue of the economy, which is, of course, paramount, uh, uh, the issue of health and the global governance of health remains central. We talked about the vaccines, and so that's one concrete deliverables uh, we had. We need to make vaccines available to all. We also need to make testing and therapeutics available uh, to all. But you know, there's another thing that needs to be done, and that was uh, done this morning, that was launched this morning. We also need to prepare for the next pandemic. And what we did today was to launch around, especially the uh, ministers of foreign affairs of many countries, uh, including France and Germany in the lead, uh, the One Health approach. The One Health approach is very simple. It's to consider that human health is linked with animal health. And we all heard about uh, bats and pangolins. Uh, and also linked with the environment. And so uh, what we did was to launch uh, the uh, process that would lead to a new council on uh, human and animal health that will be able to alert uh, the, the world on uh, uh, pandemics, especially in that link between animal and human health. That's one concrete thing that the Paris Peace Forum can do and can launch. Indeed, I can hear many people applauding that, uh, but some people might equally be a bit skeptical and say uh, China has such economic power that no matter what you do in trying to, to, to try to force them to uh, stop mistreating animals, or uh, as we see it, or as some of us see it, stop mistreating animals, uh, stop eating pangolins, eating bats, um, they're going to ignore it because basically they're calling all the economic shots. Isn't that, and I'll put this to both, both you, you gentlemen, both to you, Justin Weiss, and to you, Frederick Charion. Um, isn't that the problem that China does have too much economic hold over the rest of the world? Frederick, I'll let you reply first. 
Well, um, yes, it's true, but China wants to show some signals of goodwill these days. So, of course, you're right. I mean, nobody can constrain China or force China to do anything China doesn't want. But China wants to maybe, be maybe seen someone as, should. Um, as a fair player. Sorry? I must just say maybe someone should uh, force them to, to, to change, to, to, to clean things up. I don't know but how. China recently wants to be wanted to be the leader, kind of leader of multilateralism instead of the United States. And China also wants to, to change its image. So China might be, uh, might have some incentive to show some goodwill. But you're right. As usual in international relations, no one can uh, constrain the powerful, a big power to do what it doesn't want to do. Indeed. Business calls the shots. There are back channel negotiations when, for instance, um, a Western leader goes to Beijing to meet Xi Jinping. There are discussions, obviously, that go on behind the scenes uh, on human rights and other issues. But the headline always seems to be the, the amount of deals that are done and, and the amount of money that's changing hands and, and how China, again, is, is leading the market in, in various uh, ways. I'm just thinking of, of rare earths, things that are essential for all the electronic products that we all buy and love here in the West. There's essential ingredients coming from China that, you know, only come from China. So China, in a sense, has a grip over the market on that. Uh, Justin, in terms of uh, getting uh, the world to, to move in that direction, Justin, in terms of getting China to, 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 to make those changes, uh, are you confident that what you've started here at the Peace Forum can take that effect? Well, you know, earlier this afternoon during our official ceremony, we had uh, a statement by President Xi Jinping uh, from China uh, uh, outlining the priorities he had. One was to fight COVID-19. The second was to have a green recovery. And the third one was to uh, work in the sense of uh, uh, justice and, uh, and international law. So, of course, you can just uh, brush that aside, saying it's just words. Uh, on the other hand, I think it is important that China would come to uh, such forums as the Paris Peace Forum, along with uh, Narendra Modi, around, uh, along with uh, Justin Trudeau and uh, many others, uh, precisely because these words uh, actually matter. And what we've seen is China being more and more enmeshed, more and more intertwined uh, with the rest of the world, and that it is not insensitive to pressure. I'm not saying that it will change its stance on many different things, but we've seen either on climate issues or on uh, trade issues that uh, indeed uh, uh, engaging China and doing both uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, give and take, uh, if you'd like, or transactional uh, relationship on the one hand, and on the other hand, the engagement was the best way forward. And in any case, China would be there to remain. So the more we can influence it, including by having China uh, participate and show its good face. And the more we will hold it to its word, I think the more progress we will be able to make. I think you've undersold it a little bit because these words on Xi Jinping, I mean, this is actually, this, I think this is actually big progress that the Chinese, lead, that the chi that the Chinese leader should come out and say such things uh, in a public forum like that. Yes, yes. No, no, I'm not I'm not belittling that. I'm just uh, uh, saying that, uh, you know, at the Paris Peace Forum, since we started two years ago in 2018, we are very sensitive to uh, 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 getting things done rather than saying things. And so we are very sensitive about the distance between words and deeds. And that's why we have so many deliverables. That's why we put forward concrete projects and initiatives rather than have a conference where we would just, you know, shoot the breeze. Uh, and so uh, my my point was to say these words go in the right direction and uh, we will make sure that we uh, follow uh, them with attention and that uh, they are translated into action. And I'm sure everyone, uh, me and I'm sure Frederick included, will applaud exactly what you said. Well done. Let's bring Frederick Charion back in, Professor of International Relations. Uh, Frederick, can, can I talk green things? So Justin, they're talking about Xi Jinping talking about a green recovery. Joe Biden, no sooner uh, he's president-elect, he says that in 77 days he'll be back inside the Paris uh, Climate Accords, COP21, uh, the very same thing that Donald Trump couldn't wait to take the USA out of as soon as he was elected four years ago. Um, this has to be good news, doesn't it? Oh, yes, uh, of course, because uh, environment, uh, climate change and, and so on, 
uh, have been recognized as key problems and, and emergencies uh, by most of the world community, most of the international community, not only the states, but also non-state organizations. Uh, the phenomenon like Greta Thunberg and personalities like that have helped a lot. So there is an awareness today in the world that these are priorities. We had a problem. Uh, the problem was called Donald Trump, and it's not a small problem because it's the United States. So, uh, of course, the coming back of the, 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 the the, the expected comeback of the U.S. Uh, at the table of uh, climate change negotiations is obviously a good news. China also wants to make an effort. Uh, it will not be uh, simply um, to resume to the situation as it was after the signature of the of the Paris Agreement in, in 2015. It will be different because things have changed, things have evolved. The United States will not probably just come back as nothing had happened. Uh, there will be a new negotiation, there will be new talks probably, but it's a very good news. The EU has always been committed. Canada, Japan, and other powers have always been committed. Uh, we were waiting mostly for for the U.S. and for and for China already in 2015. Now China says it will make a, a substantial effort and it's part of its priorities. And we have a new president elect who says the same. So of course it's a good news, and it's also a good news for multilateralism because it means that a new debate will take place. Indeed, and that is a good thing. And like you say, it, it's it, it is very promising. Uh, that these things are coming back into a sense of trying to do uh, something for the common good across the board. W one of the basic problems, I suppose, with multilateralism, um, and I think we've seen it already over the past four years, is when you get a leader of a country whose, whose mandate is based upon uh, just representing that country and reducing that country's uh, influence on the world stage. I'm thinking America first. I'm thinking perhaps of certain um, I mean, so we've heard it from China in the past, we've heard it from India in the past. You know, we should be free to pollute while we are developing, those kind of things. Um, this is the problem, I suppose, with multilateralism. It's a group trying to tell one individual country what to do, where perhaps that leader has a very different point of view. Uh, Frederick, can I ask you about, uh, for a thought on that? The problem of multilateralism is um, mostly that it's an awkward position because when everything goes right, when there are progress, um, nobody really mentions multilateralism. Uh, but when everything is blocked, everybody criticizes multilateralism. That's the first problem. The second problem of multilateralism, and you just mentioned that the case of Trump with America first, is that it's an easy scapegoat. Uh, every time someone in a country has economic difficulties or just wants to uh, to flatter a, 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 per, a section of its electorate. Uh, multilater multilateralism is a good target for that, and it is dependent. We are all dependent on national processes, political processes, where one individual can uh, can yeah take uh, multilateralism as a scapegoat. So we expect it is changing, but uh, with, with the new presidency in the U.S., but we are not quite sure about uh, all the places. Indeed. Do you think COVID-19 has changed the game completely, uh, Frederick? Do, do I, sorry? Do you I think COVID-19, the pandemic, do you think that has changed the game completely, changed people's approach? It's very, it's very uh, interesting now because we have so many questions about what we used to call the world after. Um, COVID-19 is maybe um, triggering a new balance of power, but we don't exactly know each one. Um, probably it will help um, the awareness of the situation to help everyone in the world community to, to consider the fact that nobody can really get out of this crisis and recover from this crisis without the support of the others. So in terms of I would say awareness of interdependence, um, COVID-19 helped probably, but as usually, as we, we know always in global affairs, um, a common problem doesn't necessarily mean a global solution. We have a common problem, we were not sure to find a common solution, that's always the problem. So COVID-19 helped. Uh, make everyone, everyone in the world, including citizens, aware of the fact that we need each other, that there is interdependence. It's not, not unfortunately, it's not necessarily a reason why states uh, should agree on everything. And, and the balance of power is going on. Frederick Shari, I'm Professor of International Relations. Thank you very much indeed. Let's turn to uh, the Director General of the Paris Peace Forum, Justin Weiss. Uh, Justin, um, I'm kind of throwing forward a year now. I'm imagining that next year Joe Biden comes over. Will you both come on this debate and talk about the issues with us? 
Uh, sure, but uh, let me take you two years back rather than a year ahead. Uh, two years ago, Donald Trump was uh, in Paris for uh, the ceremonies of uh, November 11, 2018, uh, a century after the armistice of World War One, with many other world leaders. And we had the first edition of the Paris Peace Forum, and he did not show up, uh, whereas we had uh, Angela Merkel, uh, uh, Trudeau, uh, Macron, Putin, and many others. And that was a, a, a striking demonstration of its distaste for multilateralism. The next year, in 2019, uh, it didn't send anyone. But of course, over the three years, we had lots of Americans, whether NGOs, funda philanthropic foundations, uh, companies, and others. And we had the energy uh, for this uh, cooperation, because we're not only at the Paris Peace Forum uh, uh, around multilateralism per se, which concerns states. We are also for a larger understanding of multilateralism. Sometimes it's called vertical multilateralism, that it, it integrates other actors like philanthropic foundation, like the Billion Melinda Gates Foundation, like the Wellcome Trust for vaccines. Um, it integrates uh, NGOs, it integrates private companies and others. And for some issues like climate, uh, you need uh, to have all of these actors around the table, around concrete uh, deliverables. And that's what we've been doing uh, today, we'll still be doing tomorrow. Uh, and that's our approach at the Paris Peace Forum. World problems, world solutions. Justin Weiss, thank you very much indeed, Director General of the Paris Peace Forum. And thank you to the uh, Professor of International Relations, Frédéric uh, Charion. Thanks also to our guests uh, from part one, thank Estelle uh, Yusufa and uh, Patrick Chevalero for their contributions. And thanks to you for watching too. Stay with us, more to come. You're watching France 24.